HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of digital audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is gaining recognition as a resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and sales professionals. From MSNBC's Your Business to Inc.com, Fit Small Business, um, uh, Proven, People First, uh, there's a whole bunch of other sites, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, They are seeing this podcast um, as an incredible resource for those of you who are trying to do better things in your business. It is really because, in all honesty, because of the guests that I get. I'm really fortunate and honored to be able to speak to some incredible people from around the world who have expertise in a variety of business areas. They join me in a conversation and uh, provide you with some great uh, ideas and expertise and input. And today is no different. My guest is Trevor Thronis. Trevor is a veteran coach who specializes in working with growing businesses from $2 million to $2 billion in sales. He's helped hundreds of entrepreneurs, organizations, and business families across North America fix people problems, enhance communication, attract top talent, and build exceptional cultures. He and his wife, Jennifer, live in Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks so much for joining me today, Trevor. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. I am too. So, 
so I, I, I so love this concept of fixing people problems permanently <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's a bold claim, isn't it? Yeah, it really is a bold claim. So how is that possible? So here's the thing, Robin, it actually is possible. And you can get on the route to getting that done. Um, in the book, I, I've got maybe 10 endorsements of people who really have done that. You know, uh, you're always going to have weeds that need pulling. But I'm talking about the people problems where it's a stump, where we need to get a tractor in there with chains and it's plaguing your thoughts and you go home and talk to your spouse about it and you can't sleep when you think about it. I'm talking about those chronic nagging people issues that seem to never be resolved. So I think whenever you're working with more than six people, you're in the people business, but um, those chronic ones can be fixed permanently once and for all, and I have a bit of a roadmap to get there. Okay. So this is so great. I love, I'm seriously, I'm, I'm just giddy about this whole thing because this is something <laughs> that drives business owners and managers and employees crazy, right? There, there isn't a person in an organization who isn't impacted by problem people or people problems. Yeah, Diane, the, the reason I wrote the book is one day I came home and I said to my wife, I've done this for a long time and I've worked in every conceivable industry from nonprofit to manufacturing, food service, banking, retail, you name it. And I said, you know, I sit in boardrooms and coffee shops and I say the same thing over and over again. And it's always about starting with people. And what I find is that while people may not be the first thing that pops to your mind, um, you know, you might be thinking of sales are a problem or we've got chaos in the office or inventory or something, but that's the dashboard. And when you look to where that needle is pointing, what, where that needle originates, it usually originates in the behavior of a person, a person who's been overpromoted, who maybe was a, a, a bad hire, a person who's underperforming, you don't know how to deal with it, a person who was once great, who is sinking. And, uh, you know, so it, it's rooted in a people problem, not that that's all the problems in your business, but that's the start of them. And that's what has to first be fixed before anything else is going to work. Ah. Uh. I so agree with this. It is so true. <laughs> you've, been you've been around, Diane. This is no surprise to you, I'm sure. No, it is no surprise to me. <laughs> and, I, and this is why I'm so thrilled about this, because, you know, that, that there is a solution to it, I think. Um, it, it's just going to be liberating for so many people. But before we really get is. to that, I would really like to talk a little bit about culture and have you describe the real difference between a good culture and a bad culture. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much talk about culture and, you know, do we need ping pong tables? Do we, people need to bring their dogs to work and get manicures and stuff like that? And I think, okay, sure. Tweaking that, that's tweaking the culture. But the difference between a great culture and a weak culture is that a weak culture tolerates uh, chronic underperformers and a great culture simply won't put up with it. Because if you've got people showing up and they struggle in attitude all the time and they just don't put in their best effort, it drags everyone down. And, you know, your best people don't lift those people. Your best people's performance sags to join those people's performance, I find. Oh, this is so great. You know, I, I say to people um, when, I, when I do trainings and things, I say a couple of things, one of which is all of your good people know that those people are behaving badly and they're yeah. not feeling so great about you because you're letting them do it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and good people, the they're, ones they're who are going to leave. Up. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I was just approached, I, I did a session and a guy came up to me after and he said, he said, my wife has worked for years for an insurance company. It was recently sold and the new ownership didn't really care about, uh, you know, managing performance. And he said, after about a year, he said, his wife just came home and she said, you know what, I've just decided to give up. I used to stay up, stay late and really care about everything. And just with what I see going on, it's just not worth it. I just have to disengage my heart and I'm just going to work till retirement because I'm too close. And I give up now. And I think that's what happens uh, to, to your best people. Either they leave if they have options or they just quit and stay. And your whole yep. culture sinks. Yep. Yep. It's, it's really so damaging and people just don't realize that the impact that it's having on everybody and that it is creating a, a really horrible um, 
culture in an organization. So an organization has, I, I would imagine, mostly good people, mostly you know what you call A players. Yeah. Um, and then, unfortunately, one or, or maybe two, not so great. Um, but how do they go about attracting the A players? Like, what do, what do they need to do to be appealing and attractive to an A player? Well, you know, again, it's the same formula. Um, a players, and my definition of A player is not someone who could be CEO or something, but just someone who has a good attitude and who is effective and productive in the job that you're asking them to do. They could be a Walmart uh, greeter, but if they're cheerful and they wipe the rain off the carts and they smile at you, they're an A player. So I'm not saying that these are, you know, CEO material people, but you attract those people by having more of them because when there's a positive culture, word gets out uh, on the street to, to their friends and people who work at other places that they're working for a good place. You know, Diane, I just, I read with so much interest a thing that came out in Forbes um, just a few weeks ago, and it said that uh, uh, 65% of people would rather see their boss fired than get a raise. And what that tells wow. me, is there's a lot of, and by the way, this came out on National Bosses Day, which, which makes you wonder, like, uh, you know, who made that, uh, who made National Bosses Day? But it just tells you, there's lots of unhappy people out there. Yeah. And if you have a positive culture that's warm, that's encouraging, where people are, you know, are talking well about it, you're going to have lots and lots of people who are interested in working there. So you don't recruit great people, you attract them by having a great culture. And you have a great culture primarily by not allowing underperformance to, to continue. And I imagine then that's how you keep these people too. Well, yeah, when you allow underperformance con to continue, I, I know, Diane, that your listeners can identify with this, that they spend 80% of their coaching and development time or development time working with their weakest players, and they just forget all about their best players because they don't have to worry about them. And meanwhile, those people are, are maybe getting poached, and, and you're just not developing your best talent in the business. So I want to flip that because I think – once you're not dealing constantly with underperformers, you've got time to pour into coaching and developing your very best people, which is going to you know, yield so much in terms of dividends in your business. This is so great. When you were saying that, it reminded me of um, salespeople who, uh, you know, like I always say to them, if you're not nurturing the relationships with your best customers, someone else is. Yeah. And Right. And they're going to get them because you're not showing them that you value them and appreciate having them. So it's the same sort of concept. Yeah. You know, when I was a young sales guy, I came through sales as well. Um, I, I one time saw a, a video in a training thing that called it silver platter um, syndrome, where you're serving up your best people on a silver platter to anyone <laughs> who wants to pick them off because you're off wasting your time with accounts yeah. that aren't buying or aren't, you know, are just high headache and need lots of handholding and aren't buying from you. And the, the right. thing goes with our people that the more time you spend with your whiners, your winners, you're serving up on a silver platter to anyone who wants to poach them. And I can just say too, I've interviewed lots of, of a players who leave and they don't primarily leave over money. Primarily they leave over number one, they have to work with non a players because life's too short. Or number two, they have to report to someone who has a poor attitude or work ethic. And that is just soul sucking. And they just, they just don't stand for it. They leave. Yeah. Boy, thinking back over my career. Um, so. <laughs> Isn't that true? Like when you think of your career, I think of mine. The reason I left places was because of my boss. Yeah. You know, so at times. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Ugh. You know, it doesn't matter okay. how great your company is. How great is your boss? And and really, I mean, really, when you think about it, a company is only as good as its people on on every level, right? I'm not sure it matters whether, like, if leadership weighs more or not, but everyone has to be, has to have that great attitude, has to be an A player in whatever their role is, because otherwise, the company ends up spending a lot of time and many, money on things that aren't revenue generating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I also recommend in the book that, 
you first start, start by defining what are the three attitudes that, that really make for someone to be a winner here? Like, what are we going to kind of score you on? And I actually give a chart, a very simple chart that I recommend that you score employees on uh, once a quarter. And it's really simple. They score themselves, actually. And usually the attitudes are around things like something about their work ethic, something about the attitude that they show up with in the morning, and something about how they treat their team. And then they score themselves on that, and then they score themselves also on how productive are they in their role. And then on a very simple quadrant, they, uh, they plot themselves on are you an A player, a B player, a C player, a D player? And uh, what is our next step? How are we all going to work towards you getting to be your best? And if this isn't the place for you, which it may not be, you know, we, we've all gone through places where, you know, it just wasn't your right fit. That's okay. We're going to, in a human way, help you find out what that is. But, but you need to be in this A box where you, you're displaying those attitudes. You're productive in your role and happy. If we need to adjust your role or give you coaching or training, whatever, we'll help you with that. We're going to get you there. That's the idea. Yeah, I, I love that. But though, I, so I have to ask you a question. Do people really yeah. grade themselves in the D box? Um, um, <laughs> that's a great, you know what, if you're there, you're probably doing the grading in the D box, I would think. Yes, that's true. Um, but you know what, the D box is, that's just a sad story. That's not a hard story. Those aren't the ones typically you struggle with. Like if a person is completely unproductive, has a terrible attitude, you're probably going to take action on those ones. It's the ones that are on the bubble that you feel like, oh, this is a single mom, or I know this guy socially, or, you know, he's just, he's a nice guy, but he just doesn't do much. It's those ones that cause us the pain. Or even worse, this guy is super productive, and he's a toxic jerk. <laughs> what do we do with yeah. him? Yeah, yeah, right, those are. Yeah. Those are the tough ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so now I got a big, big question for you. Okay. So... I want to know how you can really tell whether the right person is in the, you know, in their right seat by answering only one question. Okay, Diane, this is the thing of beauty, by the way, okay? You yeah. don't need any charts. You don't need any performance reviews or anything else, okay? This is okay. all you have to do. You have to answer this one question honestly. If I could do it all over again, Backing out all of the ick associated, like how will I replace that person and <clears throat> how would I have the conversation and what would they do next? All of those things aside, if I could do it all over again, would I? Would I rehire? And uh, the Corolli question is, um, and would I hire enthusiastically? Like, would I be happy to rehire? If so, you're great. If the answer to that actually is no, that's something you've got to address. That's fascinating. It's true, too. It cuts through so much clutter, just that one question. And I find that people don't want to answer it because they're afraid of what the downstream results of that will be. <laughs> that means I have to take action, right? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> isn't that really the problem? I mean, you know, don't you think these people really know these people are, pro are chronic problems, and they, but, the, but it's the person who's not dealing with it? is really the chronic problem? Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, I, I also talk about in the book about how it's very actually very easy to spin to your boss. So you can have a toxic jerk who sucks up to the boss, but all of their lateral colleagues and anyone who has the misfortune of reporting to them knows the truth. Yep. So sometimes you might be the boss and you're, you might be maybe even a bit unsure because... Um, you know, you're, you're getting spun to, but the, the people who work with them know the story. They can, yeah. they can tell you who all the jerks are very quickly. Very quickly. <clears throat> yeah. Boy, yeah. so true. All right. I have to take a quick sponsor break. Okay. Ex Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 
our guest book, The Power of People Skills, and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. And he's been a guest on this podcast as well. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Trevor Thronis about how to solve chronic people problems permanently. There's a tongue twister for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So talk to me some about creating a one-page strategic plan, what that looks like. Well, um, you know, there, there's a variety of books and resources that help you walk through this. Um, but my belief is that uh, complexity equals chaos, simplicity equals focus. And so everything that you use in your growth business, because that's, that's who I work with. I work in the space of people who are in very fast growth. And uh, simplicity is absolutely key. So a one-page strategic plan is just a simple plan that includes the basics of the business. And it's primarily a communication tool to be able to talk to the, you know, all the people in the business about where we're going. So it talks about, you know, what's your why? Um, um, you know, what are some basic goals you have? What's a swap the business is, fa- or, you know, uh, the business is facing? Um, what are those, those attitudes that define who will work here and who will no longer be working here? What are one year goals and stuff like that? So it's just a basic strategic plan on one page. It's quite simple to, to, to build. Okay. Um, let's talk, let's, let's pull on this a little bit though and talk about um, that communication thing because one of the problems I think that organizations really face and either causes someone to become a chronic problem or uh, helps uh, create an environment where people, you know, problem people remain is a, a really bad communication structure. If, if there's one at all. Yeah. So, right. So, so how do these leaders, make sure that they're communicating effectively. Uh, you know, here's a funny one. Uh, I, I met with a, with a business owner a while ago and, and, and I, so we were going through his staff on this chart and just sort of getting some, some um, taking the subjectivity out of some of the people stuff and, and plotting them on a chart so we could see go forward plans for each one. And so we came to one person and this was a woman and she was a very poor performer. And I said, how long has she been in her seat? And he said, oh, about eight years. Okay, so eight <laughs> years underperforming. And I said, have you ever told her kindly and clearly what you're telling me now? Like, have you ever just had this discussion with her? Because you've got lots of concerns with her and the role that she's in. And he said, well, I haven't done that formally. But I said, she, or he said, she gets it. And I said, how does she get it? And he said, well, I really glare at her at the coffee machine in the morning when we both get coffee. <laughs> That's typical, okay? That usually, like, I would just ask your listeners, ask yourselves. The people that you have concerns with uh, that that are on your team, have you ever kindly and clearly just kind of laid out those concerns and talked about them and asked them to, you know, just said, help me understand. This is what I see from my perspective. Tell me your side of this, you know, to help me understand what's going on there. And the answer is almost always no. It doesn't matter the size or the sophistication of the company. The the answer is almost always no. So, there are so many things I love about this. The first one is kindly and clearly because it's so true. It doesn't mean that, you, you know, people think these are difficult conversations, so they turn yeah. them into difficult conversations. Yeah. They don't have to be difficult, right? You, you're, you're yeah. like, I used to say when I was an employee, so if you see me doing something wrong, tell me, because apparently I don't know it's wrong or I wouldn't do it. So, yeah. Right. That's a, that's a, you have to have the mindset that the person isn't doing it on purpose. They don't know that it's wrong or it's not the best way or what your expectations are of them. Right. And this, these are not confronting angry conversations. They're concerned conversations. Yeah. You know, it's, it's where I sit down and I say, you know what, uh, you know what direct uh, report. I feel concerned for you. You used to be here. And from my perspective, I see this over here now. And I just feel concerned and I wanted to talk to you about it. Could we discuss it? And it's really a, an empathetic, more concerned place because we all know if you're underperforming, you're not in a, you're not in a happy place yourself and it's not going to end well for anybody. So if I care about you, I'm going to have those conversations, not because I want to hammer you or I hate you or I want to have vengeance. 
It's because I want you, truly want you to be your best. And another thing I just advocate, I talk about how to have these conversations in the book, but, but I advocate um, letting them know you're for them because yeah. people only listen. They can only hear, uh, you know, especially in a difficult conversation, they can only hear stuff about themselves from someone who they really believe is in their corner and is doing it because they're redemptive and they want to help them. If you're there to hammer them, their ego can't hear that anyway. They'll shut it out and they'll write it off as you're a jerk or you, you have a vendetta against them or something like that. So, so it's about communicating to them that you're for them. You know, another thing I just want to add before I forget too is yeah. if you're not a great communicator, which most or many entrepreneurs are not saying, um, you know what, I'm going to get better at communicating. Nothing's going to happen. You need to introduce a new tool that, that, uh, uh, forces your behavior into communication. And I suggest a tool in the book that I call Coach and Connect, which is just a basic quarterly coaching conversation. It takes no more than 15 minutes. It involves them plotting themselves on a little chart. You plot it, you have a little discussion, talk about go forward. It's quick. And it's all designed, how can I help you be your best? It's not a big, long, I have to do tons of preparation like the performance review that's dying everywhere for those that still do it. It's a coaching thing to make people perform at their best. Okay, I, I love that idea because it really does get you communicating. It sort of creates structure around yeah. communicating, right? Around you know making sure that you're giving feedback. But that sounds like also so that you're getting feedback. Right. You know, it it, it um, I, I hesitate to use the word forces, but it makes a structured bookmark time where you're going to talk about things beyond operational details, because you may work together and talk all day long, but you never talk about, you know, what gives you life in this job? What drains right. your energy? Where do you want to go in the future? Um, what are roadblocks you're facing? You know, it, you don't get around to those sort of heart conversations, which are really the most important ones. You yeah, know, when, when exactly. people don't work out in a like another thing I quote in the book is uh, a study that, of thousands of people who haven't worked out in the first 18 months of hire. When they don't work out, it's not because of their competence. It's not because they're unable to do the work of the job. It's because of the attitude part and the chemistry part. And that is that soft stuff that needs to be talked about that is more subjective. It's not so objective as are you doing the job right? It's subjective. You know, what are you doing to build friendships here? Those sorts of things. And that's what the coaching connect is about. It's talking about those subjective things, as well as the objective performance of your job. Oh, I like that a lot. And, and it seems like part of that is that you have to remember why you hired them for that role. Like there was a reason that you brought them on. So there was something that you saw in them. Hopefully it was attitude, you know, good attitude and all yeah. that stuff. That right there was a reason, and so if you go back to okay, there was something that I saw in this person. We need to have a conversation about where it is, or did something happen to it? Is there something else going on there? Instead of just feeling, you know, glaring at the person at the coffee machine, right, at the coffee pot, right, and, right. and being angry at them when yeah. yeah, yeah, or if you're in growth, a lot of the time the question is how has this role changed and oh, you know, yeah. what parts have been, have been bolted on that you really were never hired for that maybe you don't like. And, you know, we need to continue to have that discussion because you need to stay in your sweet spot where you're giving your best to what we're doing. So, you know, growth always means uh, movement. Movement means change. Change means friction and friction means conflict and confusion. And, and the, the solution, the antidote to that is communication. So you've got to you've got to have regular times when you're talking about these things. Yeah, that's terrific. It does lead me to another question, which is, um, what do you do when the the position the, you know the, the company's growing, the position is changing, but the person who was fabulous in it before isn't really. Um, connecting with the changes, and so they have a great attitude or they had a great attitude, whatever, and, and they they have value, but not necessarily still in that role. Yeah. Well, you know, um, 
the first thing that I suggest is is diagnosing what the problem is, and that's uh, that that is the chart that I uh, present in the book. And so, you're describing what I would say is a B player, someone who's got a good attitude but is no longer as productive or as effective as they could be, and that means the recipe is they either need training or coaching if they maybe they don't understand the job, um, maybe they need a role adjustment, maybe they need a reality talk. Someone who just says, you know, if you would just be punctual like you used to be, you'd be an A player again. But sometimes I don't know what's going on, but sometimes I just notice that you're not punctual anymore. And just presenting it that simply. And uh, many times I find that you get someone make an immediate jump back into the A box when they know what, what you know, they've been doing wrong. Maybe they just have forgotten or, or you know, have, have gotten bored with the role or but just yeah. alerting them to that it is it's it's that's the first step. Okay. How can uh the leadership communicate effectively that it's okay for let's say I realize I've become a B player and it's because yeah. I'm not, I've been doing this for so long, it's just not jazzing me yeah. anymore and I'm feeling whatever that I believe that I can come to my boss and say, let's have a conversation. Let, you know, can we explore this without feeling like they're going to show me the door? Well, you know, that, that really depends on what type of a leader that person is. And, and my belief about leadership is that it's your job not to enforce every rule but to create the right tone in the business, just like in your family. If you're an authoritarian, like I'm a dad, okay, I've got four kids. If I'm an authoritarian dad and I've created a climate of fear, then I know that my kids will never talk to me about anything. But if I've displayed that, that I'm quick to apologize and to accept apologies, I show grace in situations, I'm also firm, I'm not just a jellyfish, but I'm someone who respects and cares about them, I'm going to have a much better chance of that happening. And, and so I think as a leader, my suggestion is create the right tone of trust. And that means you have to embody those attitudes that you're laying out to your people. And if you as a leader are doing that, then you're going to create a tone where that's going to happen. If that's not who you are, that will never happen. That depends on who you are as a person and, and what kind of leadership style you're, you're displaying to them. You know, the greatest motivational principle is people follow the behavior of their leaders. So Put whatever you want on the walls. They care what you do in the halls, <laughs> as the saying goes. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, and leaders really need to understand this. So if there's someone listening and they are, um, let's say they're getting ready to grow, and they're, maybe they're adding a department or they're expanding a department, um, are there steps that they should go through? Like, is there is there an internal conversation they should have to get really clear about what their expectations are, what they're looking for? Because you said something before about in that one conversation that the the coaching um, conversation where I think it was that one. You know, you talk about what's your why and all of that. But I, I would just wonder about how do people know what their why is if they don't know, A, what the leader's why is, and B, how their role fits into that. Right. Well, you know, uh, that's a big topic. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm going to assume that that department, you know what it's there for. But here's a simple tool. Uh, that I use with clients that that cuts through a lot of clutter and that's just building a very very basic job scorecard because so many times you hire people but you're not really sure what you want them to do and you might have a in quotes job descri description and they might do all the things in the job description but still fail so my suggestion is take a sheet of paper and just write out what's the purpose of the job in a phrase just a simple phrase like you know to to do, to um, um, uh, you know, to do sales in this state, let's say. And then wh who does that person report to? And then what are up to five key result areas that I would want them to accomplish in the first year of hire? I'm talking about measurable key results. Like, okay, I'd want them to sell half a million dollars of product in, uh, you know, in territory A. 
I would want them to retain, you know, X clients in territory B. You know, I'd want them to build a, a team of happy A players within 12 months. Like basic things, but measurable and, um, and defined, you know, like with a time limit. And that, even just that exercise helps you start thinking through who should I actually get here? Like, does, it, does this person show a track record of, of being able to get those results? Oh, that is so great. It's so clear. Yeah, simplicity is focus. Specific. I know. That is just There's great. something in the human animal that wants to make things more complicated than they need to be. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Fortunately, my mind is very simple, so that's not my Mine problem. too. <laughs> I always say to people, <laughs> I'm a simple thinker, and here's where yeah. we are, right? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. so much better. Yeah, yeah, it is true. And the more complicated it is, the less you're not helping people help you. You know, you're not helping them be successful in whatever your endeavor is if it's right. really complicated. Yeah. yeah. True. That is awesome. So so tell my listeners more about the book and, and how they can get it. We know now they can get it on Audible, <clears throat> but, you know, who's it mostly for and where can they get it and all about you and everything. Yeah. Please. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the book is for leaders. It's for um, uh, anyone who has a team that you're trying to sort through. So you might be a departmental leader. You might have a franchise. You might have your own business. Um, but if you've got more than, than uh, six or seven people, the book is really for you to sort out how to have a really great functioning team and how to, uh, how to have coaching conversations with and, and uh, evaluate them uh, regularly. Uh, the book is called The Power of People Skills. You can just hop on Amazon and order it from there. And, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, when I wrote the book, I thought I could envision selling tens and tens of copies, like if all my family bought them. <laughs> and uh, in the event, it's done, it's done quite well. Because what I've found is that everyone has people problems. And I would say my, uh, the, the average person who reads the book and takes even the most basic advice will save in a year's time, like, and I'm being very conservative, will save 15 to $20,000 in lost cost around HR stuff. So in my mind, it's worth the 20 bucks uh, to give it a read. And um, oh, no kidding. there you are. Oh, it's so great. So I, I, it, I just thought of another question for you actually based yeah. on, on that description. So, What does someone do? What does a leader do if like they read the book and they are sort of resistant to the suggestions and the ideas and all of a sudden it dawns on them that they are part of the problem? H how do they then, because once again, they're in a situation where they don't know they're doing it wrong. They don't know how yeah. to fix it, right? I mean, what, what do you suggest they do if they have that realization? Well, Diane, they are part of the problem. Um, no doubt they are part of the problem because our business is just a reflection of us. So, you know, whatever problems that you hate in your business or your department, they're just a reflection of your leadership style. But what I would say is, man, I am not perfect, nor is any leader I've ever worked with. And it's okay to admit that you're an amateur at some things. That's okay. We all are. And, and I would say um, um, you're an amateur at some things. That's okay. But just don't leave it at that. So start yeah. to develop skills and move on like we all have to. You know, the, the, the greatest business people in our world, in the, on the planet, all started as amateurs, right where all of us are and where all of your listeners are. They were at that stage too. And so we just all have to be committed to, to not staying where we're at and moving forward. And the people thing, you know, as Jim Collins said, um, uh, the greatest business skill you can develop is the ability to attract and retain A players. So I speak on these topics as well and do workshops and stuff like that. And that's, uh, I've got a heart to do that kind of stuff. I love seeing leaders and people develop. Yeah, you can tell you're you're very very passionate about this, and and it really it, it's such a key subject, you know. It, it needs it is a it's everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. This is so great. I I highly recommend that people get the book. And actually, I'm thinking of a couple people who um, I should probably reach out to <laughs> to suggest that they they might want to like, read it. I don't know. <laughs> thanks so much. So 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. And th- thanks for sharing all of this with the listeners. This is going to be really, really helpful for so many of them. Um, I also like to thank the listeners and our sponsor. Uh, get a free trial and a free audio book from audible.com by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. Continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Imagine how fast we could solve the world's biggest problems if more SaaS startups would gain traction sooner. Welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. This podcast is dedicated to sharing experiences from B2B SaaS CEOs who are going above and beyond to deliver change that is noticed. You will hear their secrets and learn what is required to build a SaaS business that the world starts talking about and keeps talking about and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so.